As you can imagine, starting out with 550,000 variants, the first thing you might want to do is look at ways of filtering and reducing that set of variants to a set that's more applicable for further analysis. Now, there are many different ways in which one could go about filtering this kind of data. Very common when working with sequence analysis data is that you are considering that you are most likely are not having a, a large enough sample to consider that a, a population in and of itself as a control. So you would want to compare your affected individuals or the individuals from your study to public annotations of uh, a public curated data of that have assessed the frequency of variance in those more controlled public samples. So we're going to do that as our first step, and we're going to reduce that 554,000 down to 225,000 variants. As our next step, we're going to use our new variant classification feature. That's going to help us prioritize those remaining variants, and we can even go, uh, do any number of workflows from this point to look at um, high priority variants or variants of a certain class of damaging variants. What we're going to do then is do a different type of filtering and that is using the variants themselves to sort of to look at uh, which variants may be of the most interest for the type of downstream analysis we want to do. In our case we're going to first filter down to coding variants which will bring us down to 3.9 thousand and then we're going to remove out the variants that have been classified as synonymous coding. In other words, from our variant classification step, we will notice that some variants do not affect the protein structure of genes, the protein product of genes. And once removing those, we're down to 2.5 thousand variants. After this set of filtering, we'll have a much smaller set of variants to work with. And then we'll use this new KBAC method to collapse on gene structures and test for a rare variant burden between two different groups. And I'll talk about what we use as our definition of groups in this data later on. Once we have those kind of analysis results, as well as the results of all this filtering, we can choose to open up a genome browser and visualize those results and do some interactive analysis inside there. And then finally, we'll save some time for some questions. Okay, let's get started. To start, I'm going to open up a, uh, a project which I've already imported this data. And let's take a look at this spreadsheet. This is the complete genomics variant data as imported from our complete genomics import feature, import complete genomics var files. And I've already brought in just chromosome 19. So as I open up this spreadsheet, you can immediately see that we're already at 500,000 variants for these 69 samples. Now, these genotype spreadsheets, one thing to keep in mind is that what we're displaying is um, for any time that a genotype was called for the sample, we'll have that information in here. If it wasn't called, it'll be showing up as missing. And at the beginning of a chromosome, as you can imagine, with lower coverage and lower mappability, not uh, a very high percentage of these samples are called. But as we kind of go to the right, you can see we get a higher call rate in our variants. The other thing to keep in mind is that we're displaying with sequence analysis data the fact that there is a reference defined for every single one of these variant columns. And the reference is saying which of the bases in these genotypes is the NCBI reference. So in this case, the reference is an A, and a lot of samples have this called as a reference reference genotype, although some have a reference alternate of a G, and some have two alternate genotypes. Insertions and deletions are similarly called by placing a dash for the reference for insertions and a dash for the alternate for deletions. And in this case, you can see we even have multiple bases as the reference and a deletion of multiple bases for certain genotypes. Next, we're going to start our filtering process by going to Select, Filter by Annotations. And here you see a number of filtering options for our sequence analysis module. Some of these we're going to be using in this tutorial, and we're going to use the exon regions later on. But we're not going to use filter by polyfen score or filter by SIF score, although they can certainly be applicable. And filter by region membership is a more generalized filter that might be applicable in certain situations as well. But we're going to filter by probe track membership, which allows us to filter by these publicly annotated um, data sources. 
that, we're, that we've curated and you can download when you want to follow along. So to start with, let's filter by the dbSNP-132 database of common variants. Now we can choose to say, let's activate only the markers that are absent in that probe track, or in our case, we want to remove those common variants, so we will inactivate markers that are present in that probe track. Now dbSNP-132 common is going to contain only those variants that have been classified as existing in greater than I believe 1% of the population for those variants in dbSNP that have enough population information to make that distinction. As you can see, we're moving along at a very good pace here, but I've already pre-computed the results for this, so let's go ahead and cancel and close this guy and go to the results, which is going to be this dbSNP-132 Common Probe Track Membership Results. Now this is going to be a list of every single one of the variants that are in our spreadsheet that was also found in that annotation track. And all of the columns here are going to be all of the data fields that are present in that annotation track. As you will see later, we'll be doing another filter and there will be a different set of columns. And we could even do some analysis based on these columns and further filtering. But in this case, we found 213,000. And I've already used this 213,000 to create a subset spreadsheet that has removed those. And just to show you what that looks like, when I go to our original spreadsheet, we have the 550,000 we started with. We've lost those 230. So now they're already inactive. And you can see them inactive. We can go to Select, Column, Column Subset Spreadsheet. Notice this little icon, we'll use that later. And now our spreadsheet contains only those 340 remaining variants that were not found in dbSNP-132 common. From this point, we would do another filtering step like I showed in my funnel earlier. And this time we're going to choose, sit using the same uh, feature, filter by probe track membership, the 1000 genomes phase one variant sites. And we're going to again choose to make anything that is in that to be inactive. Again, this is going along at a good clip, but I've also completed at uh, this analysis. So let's just jump to that. And here it is, the 1000 Genomes Phase 1 probe track membership. As you can see, there is a different column that is available from this annotation track. And in this time, it's the alternate allele frequency column. And this is the frequency of the alternate alleles in this population. And we can choose, although we found 163,000 variants that were in this database, let's choose to only use the ones that have an alternate allele greater than 1% as our filtering criteria. Click on this context menu. We have this uh, feature called activate by threshold. And I can say change the threshold value so that I activate only common variants, which will be ones which have an alternate allele frequency of greater than 1%. And now of those 163,000, we've created 115,000 that will represent um, the common variants from this 1,000 genomes variant population information. Now their population information is based on 1,000 individuals, and I would suspect that over time, more and more of these variants that were not found in dbSNP-132 will be introduced to dbSNP and probably show up in version 123. But it's interesting to see that there is already another 150,000 that were not in dbSNP-132 that we continue to find with a high population frequency. So from here, we can choose to um, create a list of only these 115,000 common variants, again, by going to select row, and this time we'll do a row subset spreadsheet. Now this spreadsheet contains only these 115,000. And I've already done this and named this guy this 1000 Genomes Phase 1 Probe Track Membership greater than 1%, and we'll use that to do more filtering. So going back to where we're at in our presentation, we filtered down by this population information. And we filtered down by both the dbSNP-132 common and the 1000 genomes, and we've gotten down to 225,000 markers. Now let's do a variant classification step where we classify those variants to, in their relation to gene annotations. So from this spreadsheet, I didn't quite show you the next step, but for those of you familiar with SVS, when you have this kind of spreadsheet of 115,000 variants, it's just a matter of mechanics of using this to deselect the variants in another spreadsheet that match um, this list. 
and that's what I did here. I said um, dbSNP-132 common probes removed, as well as the um, 1,000 genomes, 1%. So here's that 225,000. And now we're going to do that variant classification step. So we can find this in the analysis menu, variant classification. And there's going to be quite a few options here. And as always, you can click on the help button at every dialog, and it will go to our, our detailed manual, which will describe all of the different uh, choices you can make here. For our purposes and for most purposes, the defaults are going to make a lot of sense. And both at the classification level and the coding classification level, you can choose to alter the priority of different variants and how they get reported. But all we need to do is select our annotation track that we want to use to define our genes. And as you can see in 7.5, we've expanded the number of gene annotation tracks that we, uh, we deploy defaultly to include not just RefSeq and known gene, but also Ensemble, ACEFU, and the CCDS gene set of coding variants or of coding genes. We're going to select RefSeq, and we also need to select the reference sequence track. This is providing every single reference base pair so that we can construct those protein products of those genes to classify variants. And there are going to be a number of ways of classifying variants, and we can specify the distance from the gene that we classify them as upstream or downstream, or the distance to the exon, exon splice site to classify intronic and exonic variants. We're going to just leave those as default and hit OK. There's also a number of reports we can choose to, enact, to activate, and we're going to leave those on. And what it's doing is creating a set of all of our markers that are present in our spreadsheet and all of those variants, and then it's going to compare that to the set of gene annotations that are relevant to those markers, and then classify all of those markers in the context of all of those genes, and then classify another report of just the coding markers in the context of how they affect the protein product of those genes. Again, this is going along at a pretty good clip, but let's just cancel out of that because I do have that spreadsheet created. And so these are all the results spreadsheets from that um, analysis you'll see the variant classification counts per gene. And as we open that, we'll see that this is kind of a nice way to be able to quickly quantify, is there genes that have, for example, a large number of variants um, in, in different categories? So if we were to, for example, sort, which we can do on any column in our spreadsheets, um, on the splicing coding variant count, there's a gene here that has 93 uh, variants that are present in our spreadsheet that are in a splicing or coding position of that gene. Okay, let's go on to the next report from this, this analysis. This variant classification report will list every single one of those variants, 225,000, and classify them in the context of genes. And as you can imagine with the whole genome data set, quite a few of those are going to be intergenic, but as we scroll down, we'll hit our first gene here. And then you can see that there are intronic encoding variants for this gene. Moving on to our next report, and again, there's quite a few different workflows that you could, um, you could potentially use directly off of this, each one of these spreadsheets, but I'm going to have to move along. Here is now the coding variant classifications, and of those um, 225,000, only 3,800 and some fall within coding regions of genes and we can classify the effect of that variation from the reference to that gene product. So right off the top here, we can see that this uh, mutation at the 666th base of the um, transcribed coding gene pr product in RNA space, essentially, goes from a G to an A, and that introduces in the protein space a stop codon. Whereas not every mutation is going to be um, introducing a stop codon or even int introducing a non-synonymous change to the protein sequence, we'll see that some of these will be um, synonymous mutations, such as this one, which goes from a C to a T and the transcribed space, but does not affect the protein sequence. Using the right-click menu of this column, we can use this feature called value counts to get a quick overview of what's contained in this column sp for this spreadsheet. This is a nice way to say, oh, wow, look, we actually have some fairly damaging mutations in this data set. This may not be in every sample, but at least one sample has some frame shifts, deletions, insertions, and substitutions, as well as stop gains and stop losses. But as you can imagine, quite a few samples or quite a few of these variants are synonymous. So let's use those synonymous variants as a filtering tool.